Hey guys, what's going on? Josh here from Polymathics, and today we're going to talk about one of the greatest plays of all time and tragedies, King Lear. Now, the reason why we're going to talk about this is couple-fold. One is I have a channel about polymathics, and for those of you that don't know, polymaths are, it's just another name for Renaissance men. And one of the greatest Renaissance men of all time was William Shakespeare. Um, he's probably one of the most prolific, no, he is the most prolific, renowned uh, poets, writer, playwrights of the Renaissance period. And so, um, and so it's definitely relevant for this channel to talk about him and his writings. The other thing is that King Lear has some lessons that are relevant for today's society and for us. And, um, and lastly, as I go through my daily activities, in this case, uh, I was taking a college course, a Renaissance literature uh, course, uh, I realized like there were a lot of things I didn't know or understand and when I looked for the information it wasn't easily found so what I'm gonna try to do here is give you guys a brief background a brief summary and then kind of explain what does this mean for everyday life so um, with that being said uh, like I mentioned King Lear was written by Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, um, in the early 1600s. So I think it was like 1605. Um, and the reason why this is important um, is because of the political climate of the time and what the, the, the theme uh, of King Lear was about. So, bear with me here, but if you go back in time a little bit, anybody who's uh, watched the, the show The Tudors on, I think it's, it's either HBO or Showtime, it's a really great show, but it follows the life of Henry VIII. And he was, he was one of the most, um, what's the word, influential rulers of the Renaissance and he was also one of the most scandalous monarchs that ever lived and um, and it was during a time uh, where so many things had happened so let me give you a, a brief run through and then hopefully it all makes sense in the end so roughly around the 1500s the Gutenberg press is created and what that allows is for mass production of texts and books and liter literature um, to the masses and you know about half a century after that um, Shakespeare is born and it, not only that but so the Gutenberg or the the printing press let me back up here sorry I'm getting all the printing press is one of the key things that ignited the Renaissance the Enlightenment be, period because it allowed for all of this knowledge and information that had been kind of closed away to be spread um, very much like the internet has now allowed um, the proliferation of knowledge globally um, and also it allows it instantaneously but that's another story so just like just like the internet the the printing press came out and all of a sudden we see all of these Renaissance men start popping up and um, and then there becomes this struggle between church and state um, the church the Roman Catholic Church in particular has a lot of power that's intertwined with government at the time and up until Henry um, most of the monarchs just kind of rode that wave um, where the king was basically, you know, the ultimate ruler, but 
what happened with King Henry is that he he wasn't satisfied with his first wife, to be to be honest. He was very scandalous. And it, to really get an idea, like watch the Tudors. I'm sure it's a little hyperbolic, but it's still a really good representation of, you know, the character and what was going on. And so, um, in order to get his way, not only did he have a lot of people beheaded and murdered, but um, he essentially uh, had had the the government change politics and the religion of England from Roman Catholicism to Lutheranism. And so um, so what that did was it caused great unrest and um, he never ended up, he never had a son despite the many concubines or he never had a son who lived to take the throne. And despite the many concubine and wives that he had, um, he was basically left with daughters. And after he died, his first daughter, uh, Mary, who was the daughter of um, Catherine of Aragon, she was like her mother who was very devout Catholic. And so she was constantly trying to um, impose this new, or to bring Catholicism back into the, the political arena. Um, unfortunately, because of her father's, you know, what he had done in the past, um, the, most people were Protestant and they had a lot of grievances against the Catholic Church. And so, um, she struggled to, to bring Catholicism back and it, during that time, she ended up like persecuting a lot of a lot of non-Catholics and killing them, like having them, um, you know, murdered or not, you know, like beheaded and stuff and burnt at the stake. And that's where the term Bloody Mary comes from. I don't know if you guys remember, like when you were a kid, it was like Bloody Mary, Bloody, and you couldn't like look in a mirror or something. Um, that used to trip me out, by the way. That all comes from Mary the First, who was the daughter of King Henry the Eighth and Catherine of Aragon. She was trying to bring Catholicism back uh, as the main thing of the the government. And as a matter of fact, she married um, the Holy Roman Emperor's son. I think his name was King Philip of Spain, um, in order to try to close those ties up. Um, but. Unfortunately, she died an untimely death, like roughly five years after she took over the throne. So she didn't have enough time to really uh, get any traction or momentum going. After that happened, um, the next sort of heir in line was her half-sister, um, Elizabeth. And Queen Elizabeth was the daughter of Henry's second wife, Anne Boleyn, who was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, very, like very heavily Lutheran. And so she came in and she was actually, she turned out to be a really great ruler, that not necessarily in terms of character, but in the sense like she was a strong monarch who did a lot of things for England. And, and, helped the nation stay strong. Um, she used her womanly charms to court many different nations and um, courtiers. And even though she never got married, that's why she's considered to be like the, um, the what do you call it? The, like the Virgin Queen. She used those alliances to make England stronger. But, um, so what happened? What happened was, upon her death, the next person in, in line of succession was King James of Scotland. Um, he, was, uh, he was a Scottish king, or he came from Scotland, and, um, and this is the same King James as the King James Bible. So those of you who are, 
um, you know, who have read the King James Bible, this is the king who had that all kind of worked out and set up. And um, the purpose was so that, you know, the, the word of God it could be spread out through throughout Britain. Oh, that's another thing. So when, so before it was Scotland and England, but then when when Elizabeth died, and James took over, Scotland and England became Great Britain. Um, and so, what does this mean? What what does this have anything to do with Shakespeare or King Lear? That's all the background, and that's the boring stuff. It's out of the way now. Shakespeare lived, and, and specific, more specifically, he wrote during the times of Elizabeth, and when she passed, um, he 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 wrote during the times of both of those monarchs, both of both Elizabeth and James, and so he was very aware of all the conflicts and problems that this church versus state had caused not only for the royals but how it trickled down and affected the nation itself right england and its people were crippled because of this ongoing religious identity crisis that the country had and so um so what we see in a lot of his plays is like he the tragedies and things like that like he has warnings not only for the people but for the monarchs on how to rule and that's where king lear comes into play king lear is this very in my mind he's very similar to henry the eighth he's sort of cocky a little pompous and very like power hungry so to speak but he doesn't want all the responsibilities of ruling a country. So instead, what he does is when, he, when he's older, he, he, he says, you know what, I just want to be king and enjoy it, but I don't want all the, the responsibilities that come along with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divvy up the kingdom between my daughters and their husbands so that I can, you know, be lazy, <laughs> basically. And... Um, and what happens is um, two of his daughters who have um, ulterior motives, Goneril and Reagan, they, what they do is they, um, they kind of manipulate him. They flatter him. They do these big displays of affection and, and sweet talk him so that he feels as though they love him. Whereas um, his third daughter, Cordelia, she would rather um, show her love through actions and sort of doesn't do the whole flattery thing. Well, this pisses Lear off. And he basically, like, denounces Cordelia and sends her out, like, casts her out. And so the two, like, evil daughters then take control of the kingdom. And eventually, because of all the power that they have, they're they're able to overthrow his throne and take over the kingdom. And so during this time, like, Lear goes mad. He's, like, roaming around. And, um, you know, all these things happen. Um, but at the heart of the story is Lear suffered from the... Um, not the sin, the, um, well, well, we'll just say, he suffered from the sin of hubris, right? For those of you that don't know, hubris is pride in a sense. It's, it's thinking so highly of yourself and being, and, and allowing compliments and flattery to blind you to the reality of things. And so that's what, that hubris is just a fancy way of saying pride. And so um, it was a vice, so to speak. Um, so what happened was because of, because of his pride, because of his hubris, he was blinded by his two daughters' actual intentions of taking over the kingdom. And he was also blinded to the loyalty 
of Cordelia and you know Kent and some of the others, um, Albany I think, um, who who really would have supported him. And in the end, what happens is um, you know they, it ends like they're in a graveyard and Cordelia dies in his arms. He dies again. It's a tragedy. But right before he dies, and this is what makes him a tragic hero and the protagonist of the story, is that right before he dies, he has a moment of epiphany. He's enlightened to the fact that, you know, um, he should have done things differently. And so, even though he can't, he knows now what he should have and could have done. And, and that Cordelia, like, there are deeper things to life than just, um, you know, power and pleasure and, and that Cordelia was a good daughter. The, all of those things not only make him a tragic hero because he, he realizes it at the end, but um, what they do is because he's not able to take action on this newfound enlightenment, that's what causes him to be tragic, but that's also what causes the lesson to resonate with the audience because they feel for him in that moment because even despite his character flaws and everything he meant well and he never meant for all of this terrible stuff to happen and he realizes too late what the right course of action should have been and so because the audience feels for him and empathizes with him and can relate with him, this lesson resonates with the audience. And then they ask themselves, subconsciously at least, how can I avoid the same fate, the same tragic fate as King Lear? And the reason why this is important is because I believe that um, King Lear was written as a little bit of a warning for King James. He had just, I think King James took uh, took over the, the throne roughly in the 1600s. King Lear came out in 1605. Um, there's two versions, by the way. There's the quattro, quattro, it's either quattro or quarto, and the folio. Um, one is an older version, one is a newer version. Shakespeare was known for making revisions based on, you know, who the actors were, who the audience was, and the, the, the political environment of the times. So as the years progressed and this play continued on, he saw better ways to depict certain actions. The point is, um, the play sort of evolved as his ideas on the matter evolved. But I believe that this play was a message for the king to basically say, okay, the Tudor dynasty has ended. And you, so when, when Queen Elizabeth died, that was the end of the Tudor dynasty. And then when, when King James came down from Scotland, that started the Stuart dynasty. And so he said, what he was saying was, with this new dynasty, don't make the mistakes of the old dynasty. There are a lot of similarities between King Lear and his family and Henry VIII and his family. And, and one of the biggest problems that plagued Henry VIII's, the Tudor dynasty uh, towards the end was the fact that the legitimacy of authority and, and the fact like that the, the power was given to children who, were, um, who had their own agendas and didn't necessarily it didn't necessarily help the nation it sort of brought it down into ruin all of this back and forth religious and and political battles caused the nation and the people to suffer and so the message here for the king is to maintain that authority and to not be blinded by hubris right to 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 stay strong and um and, and, you know, rule with an iron fist, so to speak. Now, 
some would say, and they're probably right, that King James didn't, but that was the message anyways. Um, also, it's fair to note that um, both Elizabeth and James both enjoyed Shakespeare and always had him giving them plays. Um, so lastly, what I'll say is this, is how does this lesson of King Lear affect us in our own lives? And I think it's pretty obvious, right? Like, um, don't allow yourself to be flattered um, by words. Uh, Robert Greene in The 48 Laws of Power, one of the greatest um, best-selling books ever written, uh, touches on this a lot. But words and flattery are just air, right? Um, another person who talks about this is, um, oh, God. I, there's a guy, oh, what's his name? Pierce, Alan Pierce. I'll, I'll have to look it up, but he's, he's one of the experts on body language and what he says is people can say a lot of things and, and do a lot of words but that only comprises of like seven percent of the actual communication the truth of the communication lies within their body language and lies within their actions and we can judge a person more on their actions so don't be deceived by this facade or a seduction that someone is, is tempting you with. Instead, look at things how they are and see them for what they are. Judge a person by their actions, not just the words that they say. If someone says, oh man, I'm sorry, dude, I, I won't do that again, and then they're constantly late, then they're giving you lip service, right? Um, and and there, there are a million examples of this, but I think you guys get the point. So anyways, in a nutshell, that's my summary of King Lear. There's a little bit of background. You know what the story's about now. You know, you understand, you know, the, the backdrop of it and who some of the main characters were. And now you also understand, hopefully, you know, what the lesson of all of that was. But um, hopefully this was helpful. And whether you're doing a course on King Lear and you have to write something about it, or you were just interested um, and, and you know you were able to find some you know gem within tucked away within all, all of this uh, talking that I've been doing, then it's been helpful. But um, until next time, take it easy.